Let's have a look at the details of the E1 mechanism. E1 mechanism is first order elimination, or the way that we can remember this is one molecule falls apart in the first step of the reaction. So it's very much like SN1. Let's start by drawing a generic E1 reaction. For the E1 reaction and also for E2, you have to have at least two carbon atoms in the molecule. One carbon atom has to have a hydrogen and one carbon atom has to have a leaving group. But the substituents, the other substituents on the carbons don't matter, so we'll just write those as R groups. And then in this reaction, again, the first step is loss of the leaving group. So the leaving group comes off. And when the leaving group is removed, we are going to form a carbocation. Just like with SN1, this carbocation can undergo rearrangement if it is not tertiary. So like with the SN1 mechanism, and after we form the carbocation, we're going to look for ways in which we can stabilize the carbocation through re rearrangement. Once it gets stabilized, then we bring in a base which abstracts that important hydrogen. The carbon-hydrogen bonding electrons come down to form the carbon-carbon double bond, and we end up with an alkene. So if you've looked at all my videos for the E2 mechanism, you saw that the E2 mechanism is actually really, really complicated. There's a lot of things that we have to consider as we are forming the product on paper uh, for the E2 reaction. The E1 mechanism is much more simple than E2. So here are the, the conditions or the things that we have to think about. First of all, the substrate or the electrophile or the alkyl halide, the reactant, cannot be primary because the reaction starts by formation of a carbocation and the carbocations, as we learned in the um, SN1 material, we cannot form a primary carbocation in, in this reaction. So our substrate cannot be primary, meaning that this carbon right here cannot have two hydrogens attached to it. Um, that is the only condition for the, the structure of the substrate. The second thing that we have to think about, we just have to keep in the back of our head, is that this reaction competes, the word that we use is competes, with SN1. So because both of the, the E1 and the SN1 reactions start with the exact same initial step, the first step of E1 and SN1 is exactly the same. So um, because they're both exactly the same, it's really normal for us to do E1 and SN1 simultaneously, meaning that not only are you going to be making an alkene out here, you're also going to get some SN1 substitution products as well. And that's just something that we have to keep in mind as we are predicting the products of these reactions. So usually, not always, but usually E1 and SN1 occur simultaneously. And this E1 SN1 competition is going to be something that I talk about in a later video. But for now, just kind of keep it in the back of your head. Um, for the next thing, so in the E2 mechanism, we talked quite a bit about regio selectivity. Regio selectivity is just a fancy way of asking where is the carbon carbon double bond going to be located in the product. And with the SN2 react, or excuse me, the E2 reaction, we could control regio selectivity by changing the structure of the base. If we used one type of base, we'd get one type of product primarily. And if we used a different base, we'd get a different product. However, in this reaction, we cannot control regio selectivity. For the E1 mechanism, the SATESF product is always the major product. And remember that the SATESF product is the most substituted alkene. We still make 
Hoffman products as well, and they will always be the minor products. Stereo selectivity which is a fancy way of saying if or asking if the product will be cis or trans. Stereo selectivity is exactly the same as E2, meaning that the trans is the major product because it is more stable. And then last but not least, stereo specificity, which was a very difficult topic for E2. So stereo specificity is looking at E versus Z when you're doing elimination between two carbon atoms that are both chiral or both part of the ring. Stereo specificity actually does not apply to the E1 mechanism. Remember that in the E1 mechanism, stereo specificity was a factor because the leaving group and the hydrogen had to be anticoplanar to each other. And so we had to figure out how to twist the molecule into a conformation that satisfied this requirement because it was all happening at the same time. The leaving group and the hydrogen were both being eliminated at the same time. In the E1 mechanism, the leaving group falls off first, creates a trigonal planar carbon, and then the hydrogen falls off second. So there doesn't need to be any specific relationship between the position of the hydrogen and the leaving group. In fact, they don't even need to be on adjacent carbons, which we'll see in some examples. So anti-coplanar anti configuration is not necessary, and stereospecificity is not at all something that we need to think about. So the only real trick with the E1 mechanism for most students is usually this part right here, keeping in mind that SN1 and E1 are happening at the exact same time, and that you need to show both products unless told otherwise. Let's do some practice problems in the next video.